I'm going to call this meeting to order. We know yes. that, uh, we don't have our full uh, coterie of members because we, uh, commissioners, because we have a lot on the agenda today. And if we can get, uh, and we do have a quorum, if we can get things done. Uh, we do, we have a sort of a working meeting that we're going to start around 4.30. So, uh, first, uh, calling the meeting to order, it's 4.02. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go around and introduce the commission starting over here. Bill uh, Hargers, representative of the Board of Health Care. Uh, Owen Drew and Dana, City Councilor, number three, and the Chair. Richard Burr, Citizen. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is both audio and video recorded, so watch what you say and your antics. Uh, we do not have the minutes ready yet from September 17th, so we're going to move on past that item. Now it's time for public comment. Is there any member of the audience of the public who wishes to make comment about any item that's not on the agenda? Any items on the agenda will be able to have public comment. All right. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Item 6, TCA 4, traffic calling application for State Street and Trumbull Road. Uh, brief introduction about this for the commissioners. I know this was talked about a few years ago. I, um, I've been in contact with uh, Councilor Schwartz, and she's asked me to put this on the agenda because I understand that we have a, uh, some renewed interest from, the, from some residents, and they were going to be able to make it to this meeting today. So I asked them. I asked them them to come and for this to be on the agenda. So with that, I'd like to open it up to additional, any additional public comment. Sir? Yes, hi. Mr. Mr. Uh, I am Jeff Federer, a local resident here in downtown Northampton. And I believe, unfortunately, a couple of my colleagues could not make it today. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of some residents and local businesses. I'm sorry, sir. I'm to We wait for a call. No one was on the other end. No one was on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> no the other end. <laughs> All right, so please. Sure, sure. So again, uh, I do appreciate you getting this on the agenda, and you're right, our council went back towards this and was kind enough to speak with you all about getting this on the agenda. And, you know, overall, the TPC, DTW has been doing a wonderful job with traffic calming measures in certain areas around town. Jackson Street comes to mind, of course, South Street, et cetera. And I know you all know on State Street, putting up new signage for pedestrian crossing, uh, repainting sidewalks, lines along the road, uh, all been very helpful. But in general, I believe the general flavor for many of us who live along the State Street corridor is that it's just not quite enough. Um, we kind of feel that a lot of the motors these days, you know, between the cell phone use, uh, everyone's in a hurry, a lot of the signage becomes kind of part of the background of the USB world of our daily lives, um, just does not make us feel comfortable as pedestrians using uh, the State Street corridor. Now, um, just to refresh, I think you'll know the State Street along with King are the major thoroughfares mainly through town. And while King has its traffic calming measure, a stoplight between Finn and Main Street, State Street between Finn and Main is, as we call it, you know, drag strip. There's no uh, ability at this point for cars now to slow down. Um, just to refresh you again, back in 05, James Little, oh, who's not here today, actually filed the initial uh, traffic calming request petition with uh, TPC. We got over 250 local citizens signed the petition. In 08, TPC created the traffic calming manual that Mr. Huntley uh, oversees right now. And that has 10 criteria points on it, which we still use today, I believe. Um, in 09 and then also 010, this traffic calming request, which we asked for today from TPC 4 and 4A, um, really cited, cited to me that uh, there needs to be more effective traffic calming measures placed on State Street. Um, the areas most critical to most of us, Trumbull State Intersection. The 09 study showed, based on the Northampton Police Department crash records, accident records from 05 to 09, uh, over 40% of the motorist accidents involved the State Trumbull Corner. Uh, 
uh, all we know is a two-way stop currently. Um, in fact, it's five times the crash rate of any other intersection in town. 4A, which is the 2010 70 down along Trumbull down to King, 40 accidents with average speed of 37 miles an hour. So clearly, that sector of State Street is uh, very uh, critical, in our opinion, uh, to be reevaluated. Uh, secondly, to go along State Street as pedestrian, trying to walk along State Street is impossible between Trumbull and the campus school uh, driveway. There's a sidewalk, we call it sidewalk nowhere because it actually does. There's a sidewalk that goes across one property uh, on the west side of the street, on the state street. Dead ends, two residential properties and a campus school property, then it picks up again uh, on the way to Bedford Terrace. This is problematic for a lot of folks who actually come down to trouble, try to use the west side of the street, state street. Problematic for campus school parents trying to get the kids to school safely. So that's a big area. And then, of course, we know the market area around state, Bedford Terrace, is fraught you know, with danger. Folks are often jaywalking, trying to use some of the crosswalks can be problematic as well. So again, I realize that currently you worked on the latest uh, uh, criterion for uh, the TCA, or tra traffic calming requests. And back in March, you posted this, the TCA forward for you moved up to the number two spot out of 14. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that was based again on these 10 criteria. Um, and I, I definitely understand after researching this over the years, and Laura Hansen before she left was real helpful explaining mm -hmm. a lot of this. Mitigation funds aren't there. I understand that. And we can all sit there and brainstorm about speed humps, you know, uh, race crossways, uh, radar signals, etc. But the reality is, if the funds aren't quite there, then I think we're kind of spinning our wheels. So, after talking to countless residents, locals who don't live in town, uh, parents who utilize the area for school, St. Michael's residents, businesses, um, a lot of us are just wondering why simple uh, things cannot be at least addressed or looked at. One would be right away to uh, take a look at the Trumbull and State intersection. Consider uh, doing a temporary four way stop there and analyzing that. That, to many of us, seems to be a critical area. Summer Street is the second four potential stop area along State Street. Those two measures alone may really help in the initial traffic calming, uh, especially with motor speeds down the down State Street that I talked about. Possibly uh, considering expanding the sidewalk on the west side of State Street to help provide better uh, pedestrian flow. Um, campus schools should consider and uh, talk with them. So I thought I'd go there about considering uh, uh, petitioning the city council to be a school zone, just like every other elementary in Northampton are school zones. And then fourth, the area that I don't have any answers to, and that's not my forte, is uh, from the business area and, and uh, uh, just trying to figure out better safety, safety uh, issues from crossing areas around there, um, that would be obviously engineers, etc. So again, I mean, we're, we're really just asking for some type of immediate uh, response to restart the uh, traffic calming uh, request uh, investigation again and um, really trying to make the area more pedestrian friendly and our goal is safer. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm sorry to say it this way, but I mean, really, we don't, none of us want another tragedy here in town. I, I'll believe you with this because I know many of you have many stories about State Street and your, uh, your experiences, but I woke up trouble every day with my daughter at campus school. I hit that corner, State Trumbull, where there's a stop sign in the crosswalk. And uh, last spring, daughter and I were walking up Trumbull, 8, 10 in the morning. A car comes down Trumbull, trying to cross State, come back down Trumbull Avenue, Trumbull Road, and T-Bone's a pickup truck driving down State into town. The pickup truck got driven up onto the sidewalk, right at the corner of Trumbull and State, where we crossed. If I had been up there 15 seconds, Earlier with my daughter, I may not be here to talk with you today. So you can hear my voice. There's a lot of concern and passion and safety. And uh, again, I appreciate that you all have a lot to do. You're generally trying to work on anything. I uh, just appreciate your time to get us on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, it's a, how are you last name again? Gutterman. Gutterman, Mr. Gutterman, for those um, helpful comments. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to have a discussion on this? Yeah. Sure. Um, 
I've been applying for traffic mitigation funds through the Capital Improvements Committee for the past four, if not five years, requesting $100,000 each year. I put another request in last week. I'm doing a presentation tomorrow night for the Capital Improvements. Um, so far, it's never been funded. So basically, we're waiting for traffic mitigation funds or donations or something to make this happen at this point. I think we've had um, three traffic calming applications that we've actually proceeded with work on at this point, which is not too good for 23 applications that we have in the mix right now. As far as your comments about four-way stop signs, that can be particular warrants, basically engineering analysis to be able to do it. I'm not sure if those intersections make that with the crashes. We'd have to look at the crash data and other information there to see if we would meet those warrants. Very specifically, they have to meet certain uh, levels of incidences to warrant a four-way stop or multi-way stop, as we call it. So that's something that we can look into. Um, good news to the commission is that uh, we've made an offer for our transportation engineer, and hopefully within two or three weeks, this person will be on board with us and projects can move forward again. Things are kind of a stall right now. Log jam. Yeah, log jam. Uh, any other comments from the commissioners? I mean, I, I think that uh, when I use that intersection frequently coming from the uh, King Street side, Trumbull, and uh, visibility is poor. By the time you get a chance to see where you're, turn where you're turning onto, you're right in the middle of the crosswalk. Pedestrians can't get back in the car and you're trying to see around it. I mean, I think a four-way stop might at the warrants might be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what the chief thinks about the warrants for the, or the accidents at that intersection. I mean, without the data in front of me, and drilling down into the, it's usually people failing to stop at the stop signs, drilling across the thing, uh, or trying to jackrabbit across. Someone on the side of the, the side of the car is fast, but that's just a two you know, kind of keep an eye because this has been there, but it you know, seems to be the, the more frequent issues. Uh, less of speeding, but more of the just over anxious people, impatient, not using caution when they're going through the intersection with the stop signs. Do we have any other public comment about this, uh, the State Street Trumbull Road? What does it take to get the sidewalks extended? I mean, it sounds like it seems to me that the campus school would jump on board, but what would it take to get the properties? I'm trying to remember what the exact details were. I think we're going to have to do a land taking or an easement to make it work and be ADA compliant because uh, there's not enough width. There's not that, that one driveway. I think it's one, one, it's, go. it's one piece of property I think that's problematic. Um, I can look at the file of yours plans and see which one it was, but that was the issue at hand. Okay, I think it involves I'm sorry. I, I've heard from at least one resident. You're talking about State Street between Trumbull and uh, Bedford Terrace. Yes. Yeah, at least one resident there has a really strong opposition for the reason that it have to be a taking. Or even if it weren't a taking, you would stop. sidewalk to clear. Of course, we've heard that many times in the past. Every, I think probably every case we've had to mm -hmm. put them in the sidewalk. And there's a different location, but if we're doing sidewalks, they're looking at the sidewalk from um, up to, to Main Street and Elm Street, because there's also there's there sidewalks on the west side of right there as well. It's been coming up. From Main to? From Main South to uh, Trumbull, this gap. I mean, they come and they go all along. Um, <clears throat> is there any action that the commissioners wish to take? I mean, can the can we can the DPW look at the whether the at least take a first a prima facie look at the accidents and see if they sure. might we be good? That. I'll put a request into the middle of place. I'm talking about a four way stop at the Trump Institute. Mm -hmm. Or already has that uh, yes. also certain things. Right. But I don't know when the last time she worked on this offline was it, it sounds like it was probably back in March. She updated the listing 
of it, I, where things fell in the, the order of priorities. Yeah. I think what it was was the number of accidents as opposed to what was the direction of travel, was it mm -hmm. against the stop sign, was it speed related, all the multiple other factors. And I don't know how detailed that report is, I don't remember without looking at it. Yeah. Can I ask, I'm sorry, I, I missed this, Mike. By the way, the reason I was late, Smith had a power shutdown today. All the clocks were 20 minutes late. I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, he's looking yeah, at you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is this to be considered independently from the traffic calming application, uh, number four? Well, then can I ask how is it to be considered in, uh, in the context of that? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for the commission here, but um, the last notes that that um, Laura Hansen made on it was that there were some. That, that I think I think we we're talking about narrowing the street at that at the Trumbull State intersection, narrowing it one in order to uh, avoid a hostile taking, an unfriendly taking in front of in front of some of those uh, residences, and also to try to calm traffic, but. The availability of funds controls everything. Uh, so it was, it was basically waiting, waiting for funding at that, at that point. Uh, so uh, Mr. Gutterman here has, has suggested that that intersection and perhaps summer and state, but that one uh, especially sticks out, at least in uh, my mind, as a, as a high uh, crash area to be a, a possible step forward. But that would, uh, so, so just to pull up on this, the idea is um, that we would be doing traffic calming sort of piecemeal on State Street rather than a comprehensive, I mean, you know, the, the traffic calming application is for a longer length than just an intersection, of course, and is our, the idea is this is a, a quick and dirty, this is, a, this is a solution we can afford to do now. And we would keep everything else on the table for the future. I think, I think that's a good point. I mean, we have, there is some traffic on, I mean, we have the push button crosswalks at uh, State Street, right, or uh, center, center and, 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 uh, and state, which is, which no one uses, right. no, they, people don't use them enough right, for, for them to work. It's, it's really unfortunate. Yeah, and they cross wherever we're hanging out. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Chief, yeah. Wanna, wasn't? Didn't say DOT just do some improvements there with signage and markings? Yeah. Did they say then? Hmm? I think it was State Finn they did. No, Trump. It's good. What was State Finn? I thought it was State Finn. Yeah. There were six intersections. I think we recall seeing a new sign that says Trump Road 200 feet ahead. I don't remember. Chief. If they did, it'd be interesting since uh, some sort of went in, but as a frequency of that. Yeah. yeah. If they just got the, uh, the yellow signs, some of the plastic paint, the big signs. Yeah. Yes. So if I could get the date of that, I just, I know it wasn't that long ago, but <laughs> the collisions have decreased slightly because of higher visibility. I can give you that date. It's really only been a matter of months, it's probably not a good data stream. Any other comment on this one? So uh, we're going to the DCW and MPD are going to huddle up on the uh, Morrisburg before we stop. So well, the access to this, yes. which is just one part of the Lawrence. One part of it. Okay. We need to do a traffic study, and we're getting out of the season for that. We are getting out of the season. We're using all the PDDC stuff. We need, yeah. we need a traffic study for for the four-way stop as well. We may need that. Um, I don't know how old the traffic count data was. It's at least two, if not three years old. I'd say, I'd say it's late 2010. You know, Problems when that happens. So we'd have to look at that also, see whether or not we could use it or not. Um, if there's any help I can make, uh, let me you know, Great, feel free to input. Uh, all right, thank you, Mr. Goodman. Uh, we're going we're gonna to move on. Uh, but. Uh, We'll keep you informed in this uh, in this process. You can do it directly or through your counsel. Uh, number seven.
Amend 312.13D, Schedule 12, Stop and Yield Intersections, Prospect Street, Edward Line, Jackson. This is a, uh, this is for sponsorship under the Transportation Parking Commission. Um, I don't think I have the actual, oh, no, maybe I do. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, so I'll read it out if you don't have it. Prospect Street, East and West, at the intersection of Woodlawn Ave and Jackson Street, this is to make it a stop intersection. So uh, moved. Second. Or second <laughs> by. Uh, so, any discussion on this? I know. I, we, I, I know that we really haven't heard anything from the public on this. Uh, so. uh, Could I speak as a member of the public? Oh yeah. Uh, crossing Prospect is our normal route, ninety. 90% of the time that we go through the intersection, we're going from Woodlawn to Jackson Street. It's great. I think if I was 99% of the time going the other way, it would be kind of annoying. But I think that's a minor inconvenience. By the other way, you mean a long prospect rather than correct. Right. So my, my, my normal route of travel is, is going from Woodlawn to Jackson, Jackson to Woodlawn. I almost never turn on the prospect. I'm almost never traveling on the prospect through that intersection. I did today. People are going slow. Yeah, yeah definitely. Slow I biked through the intersection today and I saw a pedestrian crossing Prospect Street. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Galloway crossing. Galloway crossing. <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's dramatically changed the whole feel of that. I, I'm around the corner from there. I use that area all the time. I, I go to the intersection probably several times a week and it's dramatically improved to my experience. Now, I, I, I would like to be able to discuss, if this is the appropriate time, uh, the issue raised by the floors, by Melanie's floors, and, and what we might cut through there. Uh, and I, yeah, that's there. Please. My feeling is, um, chances are that any cars going through there are going very slowly, and the chance for a fatal accident is very low, whereas the chance for a fatal accident before we made this improvement was pretty high at that intersection. So I think we've, we've, we've traded, uh, we've, we've bought a, a lesser of evils here. And <coughs> I guess I'd like to suggest that there may be, I don't know if there's anybody here from not only the floors to, to address this issue, but I'd like to suggest to them that may, there might be some changes they could make to their, their curb cuts that would make it less inviting to cut through. Or maybe even much easier than that, where they park their vehicles. You know, the people working there park their vehicles as a you know, deterrent to cutting through quickly. And much cheaper than the curb cut. I look at it and I thought that you know, all they need to put a planter in one place. <laughs> you know, a movable planter that can move in a plow and you know, it's going to deter anybody from, from realizing that this is a cut through. Any other comment on this? There's another comment that I received about perhaps cutting off their, one of their, their driveway entrances. That way they have one entry and one exit way out of it. And probably Woodlawn would not probably make the best sense if they were to do that rather than prospect. Or the entry or exit? Or which one? Both. Oh, okay. on one, one, one only. Mm -hmm. Other than that, that's the only negative comment I've received in the past month, month and a half on this. Other than that, it's all been positive phone calls. You know, it's all been positive. I concur. Yeah, they might even bifurcate their lines so people come in and out. Can't go through, they can come in and out to access the business in either direction. You just have to exit the same way for some kind of barricade. They already were inside. You know, I don't know. I like the car. Well, something we'll have to monitor and don't make the point. It should affect this. Sponsorship it goes up to the council. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Sponsored. Yes. We can put it on, man. That would be great. We'll try to leave it off for this Thursday. When's the temporary?
120 days from August 27th. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, let's, does, uh, I'd like to take um, eight and nine as a group. Any objections to that? These are both for sponsorship. Uh, first is parking prohibited at all times, 227, and um, the second is limited time parking near, again, in front of 227, near 227. This is the uh, South Street uh, veterinary. We've, we had them in before. It's a, uh, I think it's a non-conforming business, is that right, uh, director? But, yeah. So uh, they have difficulty with their visibility. We all recall this, um, and this is just a sponsorship. I have a motion to to sponsor. So, second. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. We got. We can't all just relax just yet. <laughs> no, we've got to have a movie soon. But, uh, yeah. I just have a question about, uh, I'm totally in favor of uh, the, the changes as we've discussed in the past, but I just have a question about the wording here. Uh, on the first one, 312-102, uh, um, add uh, South Street on the north side from Hubert Avenue to a point seven two feet easterly. I don't understand. The South Street runs north-south. So which is the north side? It would be the west side. To catch. And instead of easterly, we should say. North. We're making an amendment on 312.102, west side, northerly. Um, from Hebert Avenue, it's got to run north. Let's not just from the. I mean, if it's angled a little bit, it could go. It could go to north versus west. If you look at two north on the GIS, is where's the line on the road? It's got, but it's very close to north south there. So I think the west side of South Street, running northerly from Hebert Avenue, makes sense. And, and I think we have the same issue on the next one. I want to check the map. Let's get a record right. first time. Then. Okay. All right. So can we go to sponsor the Livingston yeah, to work to the details? Uh, we're, more, we're moving. No, I think I think that this is pretty much right. It's, it is very north south, but this would be. The, I mean, this it is very uh, west here. But I think it's more easterly west because you got the big bend of the curve coming down that really puts you north. Yeah, I, I agree with you. the way it's phrased. The way it's phrased now. Okay, so it's not yes. really north south at that point. On the north, no, it's it's well, I mean, it's it's running. Northeasterly by really? southwesterly. Yeah. Ah, okay. But it is the north side of the street, and it's running easterly rather than going okay. down southwesterly. It's almost dead northeast, southwest. Yeah, it's kind of. It is, ah. Unless I'm. Well, I guess if, I guess if you could rotate. I made mistakes way. before. <laughs> we've we've done this before. Where if it's the if the language is off and then the intent is clear, we'll just amend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we have a holiday? 
First, yeah, first of all, it's a holiday, so there's no free party. Right. And, and I believe it was lot parking, uh, park garage parking. Really right. was all that's necessary. So the very first is traditionally parking day. I understand the first is the holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, right. Didn't this come up last year? It comes up every year. Every year. <laughs> is that <laughs> last year? Uh, so uh, last year we didn't have a parking so my suggestion would be to refer this to the parking committee so they can do some outreach, they can have a discussion about it, and they have a few months to come back and report to us. So we can just hear what they have to say about it. Sure. Last year I thought it was bag day that you were talking about. Bag day, thanks, yeah. Bag day, day before Christmas. Oh, okay. First night in the But last year was pretty last minute. Yeah. Uh, this year. October. Yeah, I think it's more a process question, right? The TPC I, has the authority. Okay. For free and reduced parking in the central business district, we have the authority. The, this commission has the has the unilateral authority. Yeah. For their consideration. So, I'll second that. Um, any discussion? in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right, five minutes over time, but now we're, we are on to number 11, which we expect to take quite some time. This is the Main Street, New South Street, State Street intersection presentation discussion from Nelson Nygaard's Jason Schreiber. Jason, where do you want me? As long as you don't block the screen that people will be looking at, it's fine by me. Okay. You can stay right there. You may want to have a view of it from somewhere else. Uh, you're on the you're on the agenda, so we don't have to officially recognize you. Is there anyone else that you'd like recognized? Uh, no. Okay. You have the and um, as soon as that pops up on the screen, I'll be able to hopefully share with you and see if we can get that done. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. So um, this is sort of a whoops. It looks good for a second. Probably not <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's back. I think my side got a little confused. Let's see if I can change that again. Better? There we go. All right, so um, last time I was here, I was uh, quickly running through with you some of the initial concepts that we had evolved for this intersection. Uh, as you know, this is a, uh, uh, I guess you could argue, problematic, certainly an interesting. Uh, intersection in the city in front of the Academy of Music at the crazy connection of State, New South, Maine, Elm, and to some degree West. Um, and one of the biggest reasons for going through this work just in encapsulation is simply because this is a place of a lot of traffic concern, this is a place of a lot of pedestrian delay and arguably pedestrian safety concerns, certainly uh, bicycle safety concerns, um, and it really is sort of the gateway to downtown as well as a, a clear bridge between downtown and Smith College and, and certainly deserving of a little bit more of a, of a placemaking approach than has been happened today. Um, what we've done uh, under contract is go out and collect a lot of uh, account data, so I won't summarize all of this again that we talked uh, back in the spring, um, to be able to feed this into our modeling and design exercise. Uh, we also did a detailed survey, which doesn't show up extremely well, I'm sorry, on the screen, but all the dimensions, etc., were done to be able to know what's out there on the ground today. Um, I'm going to go through a, a series of alternatives that, and quickly highlight some of the key features uh, as we've evolved now what is uh, pretty much a 25% design, so something that can be handed off for uh, further design development, decision making, funding dec decisions. We're very close to finalizing that, getting the final signal timings together and what have you. Um, the first alternative um, is what I would argue is probably the ideal configuration that we would like to get to someday. Uh, and, it and it includes some very nice features, 
and it also includes some changes that I think we should think about and discuss a little bit um, briefly in terms of the, the political ramifications as well as the nice traffic calming and safety uh, ramifications. Uh, the design is predicated more or less on the insertion of what is known as this uh, boulder style right turn slip lane, which is a device that, believe it or not, functions in many ways sort of like a roundabout where you have a yield condition to get through an intersection. You could fit a roundabout in this location, and many would argue it doesn't have the same type of safety for pedestrians. This type of design actually winds up having less conflict points with pedestrians. The right turn slope lanes, you'll see them here, as well as here, here, and again here. Um, they all have at their center a raised crossing device for vehicles to go over as they get to the crosswalk before they get to the next street. Um, at a roundabout, you actually have to yield twice and enter an intersection, and when you exit the roundabout, so this actually only has one yield for that maneuver. All the other conflicting moves are handled at an intersection, which winds up being a lot smaller and, and compact than the intersection that is today. And I wish this existing was a little bit more clear, but um, the existing crosswalk down the center of the intersection is a very long crossing, as you know. Um, this design really, really shortens up that distance, but actually switches the crossings instead of the center of the intersection to the more traditional parallel to the particular travel lanes. You wind up with more crossing opportunities on more desire lines satisfied significantly shorter crossing distances, which just helps in general, but it also helps to make the intersection work efficiently. Um, it also, as I'll show in a little bit, happens to not even add any vehicular delay. In fact, we've slightly reduced vehicular delay as a result of this design. Go ahead. It's called Boulder Style because it's from Boulder, Colorado, because yeah. they're big boulders. They're no, big Boulder, Colorado. That's why I capitalized it. They're the first to have really implemented it. It's been quite a, a good national success story. Um, the closest that I know of is installed in here is in Cambridge, but I'm, I've seen it on the books in a number of areas, so it's probably other locations even closer. Um, the other major feature here which really helps with traffic is that uh, today you have two lanes that come north on New South, north of the crosswalk that goes to the park here. Uh, but today it's a right turn lane and then a through left lane. And what we've done here in the existing space, we haven't um, widened anything in this design. In fact, we've only just pulled the sidewalk out a little bit here and there. We've been able to insert a three lane cross section between your island that exists today, which is actually smaller and located more here, and as opposed to this larger uh, island on this approach. We've been able to still have two lanes plus the receiving lane, but one of those lanes is now a dedicated left turn lane to get onto westbound Elm and eventually uh, either west or further west on Route 9. Um, and therefore, what's happened is we're saying that that left turn lane would extend back all the way to the point at which you would hopefully have only maintaining, as you do today, one through lane up to the crosswalk. And then folks in the left lane would be in a left turn lane. And folks in, who go into the right lane back here, but it's not just the right turners, it would also be the through traffic. Today, folks trying to get into that right turn lane are being blocked not only by those waiting to turn left, but also by those going through. The modeling suggests that by pulling just both the right turners and the through traffic into their own lane, which then splits here to either through or the right turn, you're able to significantly change people's performance, particularly at that crosswalk and further north. There will still be a queue of cars, which I'll show you a little bit later, that extends down these lanes. But the queue for throughs and rights now continues all the way down to about there. And the left turn queue continues onto the vicinity of the crosswalk. Whereas today, the combined queue of all of that, as you know, runs further down towards South Street itself. So while you'll still have uh, this section with vehicles stacked up during the worst of the peak hour, uh, they won't necessarily be running much further past this crosswalk. And 
as a result of the two-lane approach here, you just wind up processing more cars, and overall intersection efficiency goes up, delay goes down. Uh, another key thing about this alternative, and I've drawn this here because it can work. I'm not necessarily saying you should jump to this right of way, which gets into the phasing of how you might do this, but it has a single eastbound through lane onto Main Street. Today you have two through lanes where we have only one shown here. This works with the queues going back to this intersection as they do today. Uh, it is an idealized scenario because then it allows you to process through Main Street in your downtown with just turn pockets as we've shown here on the Sonic um, or other lefts as need be throughout the downtown cross section, but effectively keeping downtown as a single through lane with turn pockets where need be. You'll also notice that the opposite direction, there were, there's, a, there's a missing uh, marker in here somewhere. This is supposed to be a scissored left. But anyways, um, in the opposite direction, somebody would who's turning right, we've drawn in a curb extension here. And it's because there's not a need for the right turn volume to occur here. Um, it's just not a lot of cars doing that. So you could maintain a shared through right at this intersection. There's also length and storage in general here, which helps deal with the queuing. So this distance from the crosswalk here and the stop bar back to here has been lengthened because we've kind of kicked, as you can see, the very end of West Street back a little bit from the existing. And again, it's a little dark to show here, but today the stop bar for West Street is about, about right there. And in the future, we're kind of kicking it up a little bit. And this distance lengthens a little bit, which helps with storage. And then there's also new on-street parking here as well. As a result of needing only one receiving lane because we got rid of the, the ability to have sort of a through, extra through movement here, um, we're able to add on-street parking much closer to the intersection. And because we have one through lane through, we're able to have on-street parking on this portion of Elm as it descends into uh, West Street and comes towards this intersection. Uh, today, it's not striped as two lanes, but it certainly can become two lanes. People may invade the bike lane. Parking would help reinforce the presence of the bike lane. And just as you approach the intersection, we're able to pull out two lanes, and people can assign themselves to the left turn lane or the through further back. The right turn slip lane here helps delineate traffic for the right turn only to continue on to South Street, or they might be able to merge to go on to Main. The design intent is that that movement that occurs today where people will take the right and then merge all the way across and cause sort of a, a jumble of cars to make the left on the state, you would actually be able to do from the main travel lane signalize to turn right and get into that left queue. So there's a few design features in here that might be able to reinforce that a little bit more, or we can kind of let it go flexibly um, and folks might want to still do that maneuver. But the idea is that you can turn right from either lane on West Street and get into the appropriate turning lanes as a result. And that's not widening West Street. Not widening West Street. We actually, uh, you know, you have the ability, right now this is showing the three lane approach, so two lanes and then a receiving lane, there's a parking lane as you head further out on West Street. The, the, this narrows up, uh, I think the survey dimensions are showing this, but in reality, I think it's actually narrowing up right off the edge of the map here rather quickly, so you can't have two approach lanes. Well, that's because you have a parking lane on the north side of West Street. So a little bit of the center line shift, if you're willing to lose some parking on West Street adjacent to this hill, you could actually extend this right turn lane back rather far on West Street, and you could make up that lost parking with the parking that's added here as well as here. I'm going to move on to the next scenario just briefly because I think this is probably a little bit more palatable and where I recommend you go initially. And what it basically is saying is that we're not having a dedicated left as we come into the intersection, we're having a through left. And what that does is it provides a little bit more eastbound through capacity, but it also means we do not need to build this curb extension there. There's some arguments for doing this, which are simply that, well, right now, everybody coming down the hill is used to having two through lanes. This still sort of accommodates it. You could build this scenario first, 
and have the intersection work, and eventually you could then add the curb extension on the north side and shorten up that crosswalk and make this a dedicated left when people understood that that through lane in alternative B is also a left turn lane, and now and then you'd be waiting up behind a left turner. The way the signal works, all this direction runs at the same time. Folks would be turning left and going through, and then folks would be heading in the opposite direction, so there really wouldn't be that much delay if you were caught behind a left turner on what seems to be a through left lane, but there would be a little bit of slowing and it accommodates the perception that you have two through lanes today. So this is a good interim thing before you then go back to the ideal alternative A, which adds that curb extension. Um, what this also does is it would say that that left through lane, when you do go through, you'd ultimately need to merge into the through traffic on Main Street. Otherwise, you're in a left turn lane onto the other side. Um, that's really the biggest change with alternative B, which is more where I'd recommend you go initially. We have an alternative C here, which actually does preserve the two through lanes. We squeezed as much as we possibly could out of this cross section. It's definitely narrower lanes, much like you have today. There is no uh, concrete median. Uh, in fact, the only concrete median that's viable is back here. We've got the left turn pocket. Uh, the rest of this is paint, simply because you just can't get in. What we've got is bike lanes on both sides of the intersection. If you try to retain the current cross-section of a dedicated left, dedicated right, and two throughs, this demonstrates that it can fit in and still accommodate the curb extensions and raised crossings of the design. But again, you, you kind of uh, are more or less beholden more to the through traffic. It is arguably something you can do initially before you go to the recommended alternative B, but the biggest thing is that you have to pretty much rip out any median that you have today, and eventually someday you might be able to add this redesigned median when you are willing to acknowledge that the lefts can also happen with the roots there. I recommend going to this because the modeling demonstrates that you can go straight to the alternative B and believe it or not, increased level of service. Now, don't get overly excited in the change to the main intersection. This is west, and this is up at Masonic, which is unsignalized, uh, going from an F to a D. I mean, we're really going from a 90 seconds of delay to 69 seconds of delay, and that's enough to get you from an F to a D. But it's not, you know, huge improvement, but that's improvement. Uh, and it's largely because, as you'll see on some of these approaches, um, the eastbound right turn, which is now backed up by the signal, it's backed up by the pedestrian actuation, the diagonal crossing, uh, it now becomes an A because that movement over the boulder slip lane can happen at all times. Those vehicles simply need to yield when there happens to be oncoming traffic. Otherwise, they continue to move, they yield to pedestrians, but otherwise the pedestrians are normally waiting on the island across the intersection. You'll see that that's really the reason for any of the improvements in level of service here. Those boulder slip lanes really help take some of the delay out of the intersection. Um, and I also want to just talk to you quickly about queues. These are the modeled queues and where they would wind up. Um, I think I got, yeah, this is probably the best graphic I've got for now. The little blue dots, this is with the, again, alternative B, are how far back cars would be on average, while the reds and the yellows are sort of the worst case scenarios, which we try not to build parking lots for Christmas to, we try not to build with those queue conditions, but you can if you want. Um, and it's simply showing here, I know this is slightly uh, misaligned, just the way the sim traffic overlays it on the aerial, but essentially it's saying that uh, the queue for the through and right, as I said earlier, comes back to shy of that crosswalk, and that the queue for the left turn goes past the crosswalk. You'll see the queues for eastbound traffic in the through left lane don't actually get back that far. On the through lane, get back just to the edges of the intersection. For the right turn movement, would be right around there. Um, in the opposite direction, we've got some queuing from the uh, crossing island here and where people are making the left, but it's all accommodated easily within eastbound Main Street. In the opposite direction, the queues heading westbound are back to Masonic, approximately where they are today. Um, similarly, up on State Street, 
Um, you know, about where they are today, there's the maximum queue going well past um, further halfway up the block. Go ahead. Question, Jason, on uh, South Street here. Uh, your plans, I think all of A, B, and C showed only one lane south of the crosswalk. But here it's uh, two lanes. Yeah, this is the way that uh, we did the, this is the sim traffic queue, so it's not, um, we're not incorporating the design directly in this, so this is, the design is incorporated in terms of the intersections process. How this is drawn is just trying to represent the distance on the queues. But if you did... Um, so if we would essentially recommend that from the crosswalk north, you'd have two lanes. So, you know, one queue would be accommodated up to that point. The, the queue, I guess where you see the maximum here, you might see a maximum queue going back further in the one lane cross section. I think of this as being the during the rush hour. So when you're talking about maximum traffic, mm -hmm. I'm thinking uh, it's headed out to the interstate in the morning and it's coming in from the interstate in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying maximum in you know five o'clock in the afternoon, the light at New South mm -hmm. is it, that intersection is stopped up. So right. I think of the like, you know the maximum is extending way back down through that intersection. Mm -hmm. So. By the it's shorter here because you have now uh, an extra, you, you're no longer trying to store everybody in more or less the main yep. lane and then have a few right turners slipping out. We're now saying the main lane is left turners only. We're getting the through traffic into that slip out lane as well. I get the slip lane, so but the two red dots represent the maximum traffic under the slip lane condition. Is that what you're saying? This is under the proposed condition. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry that it should be a label. This is the proposed alternative B. <laughs> so. The existing queues, believe it or not, are not dramatically different than this, but I found out that the scaling, I think, you think this scaling is off, the scaling on the existing diagram I had was really off and was confusing. I couldn't scale it for you. So maximum observed isn't what was observed, it's maximum expected based on the yeah, scenario P. This is, yeah, this is all modeling, yeah, okay. exactly. I don't know why the model calls it observed, but it does. Observed in its model, and it's happy with itself, but it's not the actual observed. Virtually observed. Right, so I mean, and this is to be fair, when you plug in your existing situation into a synchro model, it has a hard time figuring out what's going on, where your lane conditions change a little bit further down. Um, and I, I believe while it shows longer queues or about these queues, your, your existing condition gets a lot further going on down here. And a lot of it may have to do with what I know has been a perennial issue with left turners sort of almost having to wait until the queue clears at the point where the, the West Street signal is. Yeah, and I know Ned was saying that's been a recent change in timing, so now you won't hit a red light here, you'll actually just continue on up Elm, which, you know, it, it's very possible that was a spillover effect from the queues, and that's where the model begins to break down its efficiency of telling you the reality. Usually models show queues longer than the reality. In this instance, I think it's probably showing it a little bit shorter on the existing image. I think for this one, which is with the changes, uh, I would trust this a lot more. I'm not going to tell you that you won't have queues up to and arguably beyond that crosswalk. I would be surprised if you had queues all the way down to the south. So, in, mod, in uh, alternative or intervention one and two, after the after the. Uh, crosswalk by the back of the park mm -hmm. goes to two lanes. Right. But it stays one lane south of that privacy. You don't even, you know, that, again, this is what the modeling conditions are telling you. So if you added up all of the storage distance needed from, you know, let's say that line to that line or, you know, this blue to the red or, or this 95th, which have you, if you added up all that distance and just stuffed it into one lane instead of as it shows two here, it's not going to go much further. It's not going to go past, you know, it's not going to go past the middle of the bridge, if not even the beginning of the bridge. It's not going to go that far. That's what the model is telling you. So I would come back to you and say you do not need two lanes of storage beyond this crosswalk because it's only going to go so far. It's not even going to go halfway to the next intersection, which is well off the screen. So what really, I'm sorry, what really accounts for better queuing is 
the dedicated right and the, the through, right. You've moved, you've made a dedicated left here. And this is something you can do. Dedicated left. Dedicated left. I don't know if I've, oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, I said it wrong. Yeah, you, dedicated you, left. Let me back up to one of these images because, you know, you can do a lot of this in paint relatively easily yourselves, which can be another discussion about how you might phase in this kind of a project. But the, this is such a win, making that a dedicated left and, and then inserting a through lane next to it, just in terms of efficiency. You would, If you just did that tomorrow, you would have to rejigger the timings on the intersection because you would have that much extra capacity on that approach and it wouldn't need as much time as it has. Or even if you didn't jigger the timings, at the very least, your queue wouldn't go as long because your through traffic can get around your left turners, which can't happen today. And that's a big big plus of this design. There's a lot of other pluses, but that's certainly a big short-term plus. I think as you are debating what happens with this crosswalk, I think what you've done for pedestrian safety here um, is absolutely the right thing. You know, the double threat situation that exists north of this crosswalk is not safe for pedestrians, period. It's not a place where you should ever let anybody try to cross the street because you've got a lot of impatient people in a left turn lane and then every now and then a right turner able to finally get through the queue and blow through. And that's contributing to not only the fact that you have a double threat, which is two lanes in the same direction to cross, and then of course you got the lane in the other direction, but one of them is going a lot faster than the other. Totally different driver performance. The classic problem of a double threat yield is that one driver doesn't know what the other driver is doing. Well, you're absolutely setting that up here because one driver absolutely doesn't know what the other one's doing, but they have totally different intentions. By changing it so that there's both through and right turning cars queuing in here, that it's not a free for all for the low volume right turn, you're not only lengthening the overall length of the queue, but you're adding queue in the right turn lane that doesn't exist today. So anybody coming up to this crosswalk is not going to feel like it's time to go gun it, because there's going to be cars in front of them. There will not be as many cars below the crosswalk, but there will be now cars in the right turn lane that were not there before. And that changes the performance of this double threat. Certainly, at this point, I wouldn't even go back to the double threat I keep it as you have it, one lane in each direction. That crosswalk is predicated there because of the sidewalk to the last part. Mm -hmm. And it, it is far enough from the intersection that the traffic headed uh, down in your diagram it has, has really picked up speed by the time they get to that intersection. So uh, I know we're shortening your, your capacity when we talk about it, but it's was any thought given to moving that crosswalks anywhere else? Well, no. I mean, I, I think that it's in an ideal situation for the reason it's there, so that for the desire line. It's also an ideal situation as really the only safe crossing between two intersections. And arguably, in an urban environment, you could probably have even a, another crossing over that distance to change driver performance. But I know exactly what you're saying is, is that folks are trying to gun it. You know, ideally, part of the design like this changes folks' delays and expectations as they're slowly going through the queue that they're able to kind of roll through. They've been yielding all the way and you maintain that performance as you approach this crosswalk. I wouldn't recommend that we go to extreme countermeasures, but certainly things like advanced yield bars as well as advanced yielding signing and crosswalk signing going to the latest design on that that you could. Uh, you know, there's room in here to put in something like a crossing island like you have on Pleasant Street. Um, in advance of all this, we can help set up the two-lane cross-section. So there's some easy design additions to make that crosswalk a little bit safer that you could do relatively uh, cheaply, I guess, in a way to put it. But I wouldn't, I, I mean, that's the place to put it. The best thing you could do is just make people more and more aware of it. Are you done with the presentation or? or, or uh, yeah, I don't think. I, yeah, the okay. final discussion was just about um, you know we have to make some changes on uh, and the things that will cost money making this happen. Um, this is A, but it's close enough to. So if you were to go with the whole alternative, you know, rebuilding this island isn't 
horrifically expensive, but you know, there's money doing the rays, crossing and slip islands, those are, you know, probably at least thirty to fifty thousand each just because you're doing roadbed reconstruction. Uh, the islands themselves aren't so much, but the, the big thing that really gets you here are these mast arms, which are not serving the lanes correctly in the future. We might be able to get a little bit of efficiency as we out of existing equipment as we maybe phase in pieces of this, but you're talking about buying or redoing a fair amount of signaling equipment, which really runs the bill up in terms of the cost on the overall design. I mean, up to a half million of this could be just in signal design. Would you say something else about your idea of coming from West Street into the intersection, that you would have a slip lane, but then you would also have an option to do the other one. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is, again, sort of a, a policy decision. Let me explain some of the policy decisions. Technically speaking, if I back up here, um, you don't really need even the two lanes of storage on New South. And I, I'll get you to West. I'm using this by example. You don't technically need the two lanes of storage on New South. It's just a decision of, well, we don't want the queue to go too far. The way we've designed this, the queue will be here. If you, let's say, added on-street parking all the way up to here, your queue would be lengthened by that much down this far. That's a policy decision where you've decided instead of having queue storage, you want on-street parking. On West Street, you can make the same policy decision. You've made the policy decision of having on-street parking on the north side. You could drop it and have two storage lanes on West Street instead. Right now, today, you only have two storage lanes effectively at the intersection. Okay. But you could shift the center line over and drop the parking and instead have two storage lanes. You would just be losing on-street parking on that stretch of West. It's true of State, for instance. You know, we've drawn this as the right turn lane and the through left. Well, that right turn lane today, I think, wouldn't even go to my dot on the screen right now because there's on-street parking just past that. You can pull one, two, three spaces eventually and lengthen it. That's a policy decision on how long you want the queue to go up State Street or, as you mentioned, West or, as I suggest, even New South. So a lot of this makes a lot of sense, and I, I like that it looks like significant improvements for uh, bike pets, uh, drivers. I have uh, two bike-related questions and one pedestrian-related question. Um, uh, as bicyclists come down Elm Street, it's a pretty good hill, and they're coming down at a good clip. Right. And uh, the bike lane that is in there now, thanks to your uh, redesign a couple of years ago, makes a big difference. I use it all the time. But I would be really afraid, and I know how to ride safely uh, in traffic and next to parked cars, but I predict that if we put a bike lane right next to parked cars at that fast downhill there, some just going to get bored. Some bicycle is going to be riding in the door zone. And you know, if it's Smith College uh, traffic, there might be a lot of turnover at the parking spaces there. The doors are opening pretty frequently. It's against the law, but somebody's going to do it. Some just, you know, bicycle is going to come down there in the door zone, hit a door, and get thrown into traffic, or just over the handle, over the door, and could be fatal. So that can't happen now, so we'd be introducing a problem. So I, I kind of hate to see that parking introduced there next to the bike lane. Um, I'm not worried about it on the upfall side so much where it's much slower, uh, but I'd worry about it now. This is a great spot for potentially doing one of two alternatives, which is either a cycle track, which you could do with this configuration, just flipping the parking and the bicycling, so that the bike is on the passenger door side of things, which doesn't mean they wouldn't hit an opening passenger door, but they wouldn't then be flung into the travel lane where they would then get severely injured or killed. Um, that's an easy alternative to integrate into this. It would simply mean tiny changes to a couple curb extensions. But it's a change. The ideal would be that the cycle track is up at sidewalk elevation. So you'd have to do it with a rebuilt sidewalk. You could do it in lane but expecting people to park outside of a bike lane, even if you put up little wiggle waggles to change from those. The other alternative is something that you can do a lot more short term. You can buffer the existing bike lane. Our modeling is suggesting you do not need two lanes of storage up to Bedford at all. In fact, you don't need two lanes of storage past west. 
So you could buffer the existing bike lane, make it clear you've only got one lane until you get to West Street. And that would have the safety effect. The buffer is simply sort of like putting a, a painted meeting with a bunch of uh, Chevron slashes, more or less, down it that separates the traveling from the bike lane. And that's just paint. So that's an interim measure you can think about doing the next time you have a chance to touch the paint on that street. Did you, could you do that again at, at 25 miles an hour? <laughs> <laughs> so a buffered bike lane. Where are we talking? Coming down the hill from Bedford. Okay. Um, would look essentially as it is today, which I don't know if these aerials do it justice because we got so many trees on them. Not really. But um, your bike lane is right up against the curb today. And there's effectively two travel lanes. The striping for two travel lanes starts back here. And there's so much space you could almost make it true travel lanes all the way back to Bedford. So you, but you be. Right, right. And so what you would do is say, well, we're not going to strike this two travel lanes. We're only going to have the one travel lane, and then vehicles will start to make their decision here, as opposed to back here, which lane will get into when they get towards the signal. And the bike lane, which is about five feet wide today, would have an additional buffer outside of it. Minimum of two feet for this type of condition, I'd recommend no less than four feet. That is another line, line painted outside of the bike lane. But between the outer bike lane line and this new line, you fill it with diagonal or, or slashes, you know, chevron, and we're, still, and we're still going with parking. No parking. You, oh, this would be parking. something you just throw about? into the existing condition today without parking. Got it. If you added parking on the stretch, which has a traffic calming effect, I think James's point is valid. We'll have a little bit of a change in driver performance because on street parking naturally slows the driver down, but the biker would certainly be going faster down a hill and have less reaction time to an opening door. And that's where you might consider the cycle track, which more or less puts the bike effectively on the sidewalk in the ideal design, up at the sidewalk elevation, outside of a walking zone, where they're protected from being doored by the driver near a travel lane. Bringing that cycle track down into the intersection gets to be, I think, problematic. How do they get, you know, those bikes are not headed to the interstate, they're headed into town. Right. Yeah, so the, I mean, this is a, an interesting debate about bicycle safety and the right kind of environment. Um, let me go to this alternative. So there is a good argument for having, as we've drawn, bike lanes on New South. The feel of the road is not as urban and safe. The cars somewhat dominate. There's maybe an argument for doing so up Elm. It is a regional road. There's room for the bike lanes. It's worked out fairly well, certainly up by Smith's campus and further to the west. In this environment where there's a lot of vehicles going on, I think cyclists probably like and appreciate the ability to have a bike lane that gets them up to the crosswalk safely, that gives them a space where it's otherwise cars trying to maneuver. So I think bicycle facilities make a lot of sense in here. The connection of a cycle track to those bicycle facilities is simply a safer bicycling environment. The cycle track coming out um, along this alignment where the bikes could then turn right or go straight would be an easy design integration. There would still be a lot of the same green paint treatments to let people know when the cycle track ended and transitioned into street lanes. You would stop the cycle track as it got to west, and then it would be street lanes beyond that. That's Can I continue with my uh, yeah. line of questions? So, Jason, um, just continue on that for one second. What about um, uh, keeping the bikes on the road, not adding parking there, but widening the sidewalk? So and that's, that's the next evolution that you're getting at, and that's where you know, we've drawn this with bike lanes in both directions on Main Street because there's so much room to put in all this <coughs> vehicular capacity, still have parking, still have a bus stop, and put in bike lanes. In an ideal world, would Main Street have sidewalks wide enough to take over the space of those bikes? And the bikes, because Main Street is slow, would be more or less 
expected, if not preferred, to share the lane, reducing the overall width of vehicular travel and therefore increasing the amount of friction and slowing speeds? Absolutely, it's a main street. I do not like seeing bike lanes personally down the main shopping street where everybody should be driving really slow. A bike lane is there as a defense for bicyclists when cars are going a little too fast. In your downtown, the bike shouldn't be going in, I mean the cars shouldn't be going any faster than bikes. So in this design, if you did have bikes coming down the hill, you may even receive them with a bike lane for a little while simply because there's a little bit of sorting out going on. But you would cut this bike lane out. We've suggested a crossing island here at Masonic, not just a crosswalk. And that's the point at which you have a clear marker that says, hey, downtown, Northampton, slow down. In a quarter mile, you'll be able to speed up again. But for this stretch, bikes are in lane. You do the shared lane markings. You do lots of notification of drivers. And the bikes would be in a shared lane. And you could widen your sidewalks, add angled parking where you don't have it, do all sorts of things. I'm not allowed to speed up until they get to the Coolidge Bridge, actually. There you go. So the question was about sidewalks along Smith Comp, along West. You could widen it. You could same thing there. Yep, exactly. You could start that further up the hill instead of at this point. You could have wide sidewalks all the way up the hill and have the bikes in travel lane further up the hill. Um, as a regular uh, user of the West Street, um, uh, I guess Elm Street intersection there, I often come up the hill on Elm and take a left on West Street. And then there's no bike lane. I'm okay with it, but I know many other people are not. And that's why you see bikes all the time riding on the sidewalk here. They don't feel comfortable in traffic here. It's great to have the, the bike lanes on Elm Street, but uh, I, I don't know if it's on our list lane, but I think it is, to add uh, bike lanes on West Street. Now, yeah, yeah. Route 66, um, uh, you know, further, uh, I guess, past, um, I don't know exactly where to begin, but has bike lanes um, in the reconstructed parts of 66. Um, and so here we are going from downtown through a section with no bike lanes to a section with bike lanes. Did you, uh, did you look carefully at the possibility of adding lanes on the um, I haven't looked at West through this effort in detail, but in past work for Smith College, we did look at the cross section for West. It is too narrow to actually put in bike lanes and still have travel lanes. What if we had only one right turn lane instead of? I, but with the, I mean, that's West at this point. In this row, you have the room. So between here and just beyond the library, in that stretch, you have the room. Likely, you may have to sacrifice the parking. So again, this is that policy trade-off. Parking is good because it helps slow people down. Cross street parking near a library. I mean, there's a lot of arguments to make. Uh, is there room to do bike lanes and have a three-lane cross section? Uh, probably. I can't tell you for sure as we go further west, uh, as we you know go around the bend. I'm not as, you know, in front of the library. I'm not quite sure if it's wide enough, so I can't really comment on that. Um, but at the very least. As has happened at Smith, I believe the, there's sharrows in the stretch between Prospect Hall and Bedford because the road has got to be a little bit too narrow for a bike lane. But those sharrows continue with bike lanes on either side. So it's still a bicycle facility. You're in an environment that's a little bit slower. It is better than nothing. At the very least, you should be connecting this with sharrows. That's my last yeah. question. Um, as I've mentioned many times in the past, and as everybody knows, there's a strong desire line for pedestrian crossing uh, at the top left of your diagram here, up Elm Street, uh, between uh, the driveway to College Hall and um, Stoddard Hall. Uh, there's, uh, so it's between, I guess, actually, it's where the Catholic Church is, St. Mary's. Uh, there are stairways down to uh, State Street into downtown. Many uh, employees and students of Smith College I use that. I'm one of them jaywalking. But it's a long stretch between crosswalks there, and it's a strong desire one, so there's a lot of activity. Uh, is there no possibility of getting a crosswalk? Well, there's a possibility of putting a mid block crossing wherever you want to. Um, I would argue, you, again, it's more of a policy decision on whether that's the best thing that you want to do in terms of your investment. But if you're putting one in up the hill, between signals with the current driving habits, it's going to need a fair amount of countermeasures simply because of sight lines, speeds, weather conditions that occur on that stretch of Elm. 
So is it doable? Yes. Is it going to require a lot of countermeasures? And is there a potential risk because it's unsignalized? Yes. We've talked when we were last here about whether or not we could do a crossing here on West Street that might, to some degree, satisfy that desire line, but arguably it doesn't because it's kind of going around around the horn to get there. This is a long stretch to go from state all the way to Bedford without being able to cross the hill. So somewhere in here, it's certainly warranted. It could be easily integrated into this signal design. It would therefore cause more queues on West Street. It wouldn't really adversely impact the operation of this intersection the way things are processed, but it would impact West Street. That's not necessarily the end of the earth. It is, again, a policy decision. I, I mean, currently you can't cross from state to south if you're on the uh, west side of it. Right. right. So that that crosswalk there, I, I find very valuable. I think I would use that one to walk halfway up the hill and jaywalk a little bit. But I, I know not everyone's going to do that. But I think that's a nice cross. That's a nice crosswalk to have there. I would say that one of the things that's happening here, as is evidence further west on Elm, is that. You're working towards a change of behavior, ultimately driving culture. Expectations of what happened up on Elm were far worse than they wound up being. People are performing better. You find that with every infrastructure project you put in, that people begin to understand that. And guess what? Their day really didn't get impacted that much. They, were, they lost two seconds. And so a crossing mid-block up here, Especially if we have vehicles calm and there's only really two lanes and there might be the traffic calming effect of parking on one side or the other or both will change people's perceptions and may warrant that another crossing at a logical repeated distance from the crossing at Bedford, which is at this location probably about the same distance as it is from Prospect to Bedford, would make sense. There's a driver behavior and a pattern that would make some logic. Most drivers use crossings, however, at street intersections, so it does still require some change here, but it's certainly not something I would take off the list. It's something that may take a little bit more time to be sure it's safe. And, and would you buy the argument, James, that people are crossing there because they're trying to avoid the long intersection? There's nothing to cross the street there for. The church is closed and there's a parking lot. So, yeah. so they're doing that to avoid the intersection. If the intersection worked better like this for the pedestrian, they might be happier coming down. I think that, that may well be true. You know, especially if the sidewalk were not this bumpy, narrow channel of crumbling yeah. concrete that you know leads to over wide intersections with yeah. with over large turning radii and a long a long wait. So, I think if all those improvements were made, it could well change the design. Can I, um, B, the, the one thing that kind of caught my attention was if you're going to, instead of a dedicated eastbound left turn and you make a combination left turn straight through, you mentioned that once they get through the intersection, they're going to have to start merging to get to the single lane. Right. Merge the crosswalk. Yeah, so basically what would happen is if somebody was in the left turn lane, which is a, but they're going through, so it'll be accommodated to go through here. They're now going to be in another left turn line. So they're going to be looking in their rear right mirror or over their shoulder to see the merge as they're approaching. You're not only the crosswalk, but I mean, to be truthful, people don't use that crosswalk. They jump over the and down through traffic all the time. It just seems like a distraction that you wouldn't want to encourage that merging action. It's this, I mean, it, you, you today have this kind of merge happening in, in lots of places in the downtown when you get out of the floor. So there's people merging up the hill and there's people merging as they get beyond, not necessarily here, but I guess you know, in a variety of spots you're going to have that today. Um, you know, Arguably people are merging as they try to figure out their lanes as they approach from the east as well. Coming down Main Street with two lanes and now you got to kind of figure out where your lanes are and you're jockeying for which lane doesn't have the queue in it. It's not an unheard of behavior to be trying to pick out which lane you have in your downtown. So I don't find that to be adding another element that isn't here today. Okay. Um, also, the benefit of this lane becoming a left turn lane and a you know, crossing on that's got some clear visual pres presence to an advancing motorist 
is going to get them to take their foot off the gas as well, which is another behavior you want in the downtown. And yes, they'll have to think about merging, there's no question. Jason, besides the cost of the curbicide, what's the disadvantage of going straight to alternative? Um, you know, in my mind, there really isn't. Um, you know, that, that curb extension is a, really what it is is simply a matter of are we comfortable effectively losing that receiving to lane by? I mean, I, honestly, the way I would phase this is that I would start with this and then go to this where you get that curb extension. That's what I would do. And I would start with that right away. And, and in fact, a lot of what you're seeing, again, you didn't see that there's just be a, a, a Chevron design in here that reflects that better. But um, <coughs> this, even this left turn pocket can be shadowed with something here as well. So you can have a gateway treatment instead of just Chevrons that aren't shown here. Actually, maybe why they're not in the drawing. I may have, somebody may have been doing that. I don't know. Anyways, so this is this is a better solution, and my models say you only need the one through line. This will work, but this is a step to get there. And really, the difference between this and and the idealized is extending this curve on the north side. I think, and I get to the discussion about phasing on any of this. Now we can even go to C, which maintains the two through lanes. You'll notice that all of this infrastructure on the south side, as well as this crossing island and everything here, restart. Oh, I'm running out of battery, too. Uh, <laughs> suddenly the computer shuts down and you know what happened. Um, all of that infrastructure is something that you can do right away and still maintain two through lanes. You know, you can doesn't involve a median, so you just wouldn't build a median. There we go, there's the one for my battery. I'm going to plug that in in a second. Um, and so therefore you could phase in each of these pieces as we go. So you get to B simply by adding that, more or less. That's the biggest difference between these two. You then add your median and narrow it down by lane, and then you get to A by then adding this curve extension. So there's a, a level of progression, and similarly, just to get to C, you can do that by biting off pieces in, in chunks. You can start with what's on New South, for instance, and maybe eventually add in West, and then add in what's at the bottom of State. And so, with, in a progressed manner, you will be able to uh, get a lot of this done and have the effect that you want in the downtown without having to buy it all at once. South Street is, the, is, a, is probably one of the quickest fixes. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, uh, you can do... That one's already there. You can do that in paint. You can, you've got the crosswalk, you can do the, the left turn lane, because you, this is, again, we didn't move the existing curves. So you can do a lot of this in just paint. Are you taking parking from the west side of that street? No, it's still maintained there. So coming across from State Street to South New South, you do have to jag off a little bit. It's not perfectly straight, right? Just, oh, like, just yeah. like it is now. It's just like it is now, yeah. We a couple more questions. We have to let Gary. This is, I, mean, I want to share that time for Gary. Um, I'm, I see these plans before, so I'm more comfortable. I don't want to push you guys beyond, but I, I guess my own feeling is the bigger intersection needs to go through the, the TIP process to get on the, you know, the queue for federal and state funds. So that's a big design piece. Um, I just, I'd love to see if the committee is willing to support sort of moving ahead on south, the new South Street improvements now. Um, I know the longer term piece will come back to the four months on the process. At what time does a replacement of all the signalization occur? Just to get to A, or yeah? So this is part of it. So you can do, you can do in terms of paint, like we talk about tomorrow. You can do this island and this slip lane, as well as this one, uh, without any signalization changes. 
So you can just use what's out there today. As soon as you add this one, uh, you need to start changing the signals. And then when you add these changes, you need to change these signals. This, this requires changing that signal. And then uh, adding the, the curve extension here would, would require that now starting to change. So it's, you know, you can do stuff. You know, you can do this island on your own, which is more or less just paying for concrete without jumping into the 100,000, 200,000 realm of one mass star. Which also allows us to do a curve extension to replace your people from the other standing down there. <laughs> so those are all of our beautiful ones. Uh, all right, so um, can we table that for just the so we can have Gary speak as well? Yeah. Uh, any last party thoughts? I'm going to stay here for a little while, so no, no other party thoughts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now have uh, the main street corridor plan, or maybe that might be a formal uh, presentation from PPP Sports Care. Thank you. We have a handout. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to have a few minutes with you this evening. Uh, how we got here, PPPC has. Uh, um, not quite started. We, this is actually our first uh, effort to begin the talking about what, what we're calling a Route 9 safety and livability study. And how did we get there? Well, we completed a document that we call the top 100 high crash intersections in, a, in the region. And as part of this document, we also looked at the top 25 high crash corridors. Uh, Main Street in Northampton came in at number four on our list of top uh, high crash corridors. And statewide, it's also on, considered a high crash uh, location for bicycles and pedestrians. So, a safety problem that's been documented in this area. And uh, Wayne approached PVPC and asked us if we would consider doing a more formal safety study. You mentioned all the work that's been going on in this area. Uh, talked about the work that Nelson Nygaard has been doing and uh, wanted to see if this was something that we could uh, move forward with and begin to, to look at. So what I uh, did was I included the, uh, the study in our uh, Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP for short. UPWP is uh, federally funded, so 80% federal, 20% state, and it's an annual listing of projects that PVPC wishes to undertake over the course of the federal fiscal year. That year runs from October 1 through September 30. Uh, we're right in the beginning of the new federal fiscal year. We were successful in getting a study uh, entered into that program. So what you have in front of you on the first sheet is a description of the study as we put it in the Unified Planning Work Program. Um, safety and livability. Uh, why did I stress the word livability? It's something that we're being beginning to be measured on. Uh, beginning to uh, have all modes of transportation coexist together, having uh, your bicycles and your pedestrians and your transit users uh, feel comfortable using the transportation system right along with the automobiles. And that was one of the things that we felt was important to integrate into this study, was the ability to not only document the safety problems that have been happening, but also to identify ways that you can make the street safer, but also have all modes coexist. So what I have on, this, on the second page is, a, is an outline of the study. Um, our uh, scope of work identifies the study area as starting right after uh, Jason's project, so basically starting at Masonic Street, going all the way to the intersection of Holly and Market Street. Looking at uh, the uh, that corridor, um, I want to point out our staff, uh, Kiati Parmar is here. She'll be the primary staff person working on this project. Uh, and I, I wanted to make sure she was able to hear uh, Jason's presentation and then your, your comments as well. Uh, so I guess the idea right now is that we, we, under, we expect this to take the lion's share of the next federal fiscal year to complete. 
Um, we've got an outline of potential areas that we want to begin studying. We expect this is going to take quite a bit of data collection. One of the reasons why, and I know I'm jumping ahead, is uh, if you jump down to number seven on the outline, it's uh, so that we can do a multimodal level of service analysis. And this allows us to go in and not only measure the intersection level of service for the automobiles, but to also give an assessment of pedestrian level of service, bicycle level of service, transit level of service over the entire quarter. Um, a lot of data that you would traditionally not collect has to be collected in order to do this analysis. So we want to make sure we get it right. Uh, we want to make sure that we're getting good data. And then we also have the issue of, okay, weather's getting colder. We've got an intercession over January in the downtown area that, that has a you know, large college uh, population. Uh, so we expect the data collection to probably go from the fall into the spring. And that's something that perhaps we, I may have overestimated. Uh, so I'm looking at the schedule as maybe it is a little too conservative. If we can get this done sooner, we certainly will entertain getting this done uh, sooner. But the idea at this point is to go out, begin to do the data collection, uh, document the crash history, do some uh, collision diagrams, and, and really get to the uh, heart of some of the uh, existing crash problems that have been happening in this section, pinpointing where those collisions are, identifying the trends that have been happening, um, and then talking about uh, different alternatives that could potentially be brought forward by the city that could be advanced towards, if uh, necessary, a future uh, traffic and transportation improvement project. So, um, be happy to entertain any questions you have. One of the uh, items I did want to ask you is uh, how you would prefer to do public participation as a component of, uh, of this ongoing work. Is this something that you'd want to handle through this committee? Is this something that you see would work better if you had a, maybe a project advisory committee in place? Uh, but I did want to get your input in that area. Jump at once now. Okay. Gary just asked. Yes. I've seen in the past it's not necessarily your folks, but like DOT does projects, the only get collision data they want is over a thousand dollars for the damage of personal injury. It doesn't reflect the frequency of minor accidents. Right. That's much what they do with the Day in the Road project. They were touting the intersection work had been successful, but it's all rear enders because of the stop and go traffic now. They didn't have that data. So you're saying you're going to do the DOT data and, and then come do those under a thousand vendor benefits? Yeah, and, that's and really you, what we have. I, I'll use whatever's available yeah, because yeah. you know data is data, and being able to document the trends is, is, in my mind, the most important thing of, of what's happening. The mass dot data is just easy. It's already there. It's already plotted, yeah. and uh, we know that the, what they're reporting is is good information. In other words, we, we know you're submitting your data faithfully to, mm -hmm. to the registry, so, so the quality of data is good. And what we uh, like to do from, from there is show the historic, or the historic types of trends that are going before we wade into the, the um, you know, more detailed reports that you are able to provide us. And from that, we'd be able to do the collision diagram, which will get very specific on what's happening at the various locations. Uh, probably requires us to ask you for less data as well. In other words, uh, we don't have to, maybe we're comfortable with just asking for uh, you know certain intersections. But in this case, we're really looking at everything on, on the street. Oh, we, so. we could provide it, but it's, yeah. uh, again, I said it earlier, it's what is, it may be an accident, but what is the accident? Yeah. I mean, for not only it's distracted drivers don't see the car in front of them stop for the and they were in that car. You know, no, I, I think it's important to have all of the, okay. uh, and, and again, your, your lesser, the ones that are less than a thousand, they're not going to be, they're not going to be severe accidents, it's more property damage, but um, it does give you a sense of what's happening in the area. I guess I'm a little confused about how um, this uh, PPP study, PPPC study will 
uh, dovetail or overlapped with the uh, with the Nelson Nygaard um, study of King Street, which I thought includes pretty much the same uh, to King Street, not to Hollywood Street. But yeah, our work is stopping like at, at Masonic, as Gary said, when he takes over East. Of this that. particular. Oh, Okay. Previous, you're talking about the previous one from yes. years ago. Yes. That was part of the motivation for asking people to do this. Is we had a lot of work from Nelson Nygaard, mm -hmm. but now not the sort of next level of developing the data. Mm -hmm. So this is, we think it's see as the next level of sort of getting mm -hmm. more data that's out there. Okay. And I think, James, what happens is we're able to take that work and see some of the uh, recommendations that were developed, to see some of the concerns that were raised, and we can absolutely integrate that in what we're doing. But um, what we're going to, to start, we're, we're going to start with that background research, but we also want to make sure we collect the data so we can do a lot of research. Yeah, I think it was that the previous study ended at the railroad bridge, right. and they're going on up to all right. right. So, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Where in this process does uh, public participation come in? I would uh, like to see public participation at, at a couple of spots, but that's <coughs> really where I'm looking for some guidance from you today, is where do you best think public participation might fit into the process? Uh, if we, you know, it's federal funding, we're required to have a public component. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to do it, but ideally, I think you know how well you're going to get uh, the residents and the business owners to participate and does it make sense to do it all at the end? Does it make sense to have it phased throughout? And that's one of the reasons I wanted to see if it's something that should we be working with a dedicated you know, study advisory committee? Should we be coming to you periodically and just giving uh, a briefing on, on what's going on? I, I'd, I'd like to fit public participation to what best works for the city. Mine's back to the data. So you and the chief talked about incident data, and, and, and I know you can even get incident data for bicycle and pedestrians, but and you can get exposure data for vehicle throughput, but are you going to actually collect new sources of data for exposure for pedestrians and bicycles? Uh, what do you mean by exposure? The number of movements? Or, or, yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to collect that data, yes. And, and, and will you do it by um, point counts, or will you do it by uh, trip destination? Will you ask people where they're headed? I don't envision doing, uh, you know, any type of O&D type of survey. I, I look at it more uh, of, a, of just a volume, and, and and that's based on what the methodology currently is in the highway capacity manual. I don't believe it calls for O&D data at this point. Uh. Let's, uh, let's refocus the discussion. Are we all clear on the basic deliverables here? So let's focus the discussion on the public participation. This is really what, this is something you want to get clear on. Today. And I think all it right. would be helpful that uh, I identify that early on. Uh, I'm a big data-driven person, so I think the data collection should all be done, put in a presentation uh, before you get to robot geometry. Uh, just a data collection to be able to have something to present to the public. Instead of answering a lot of questions that they're going to ask about this X, Y, and Z, then you say, no, this is what the, you know, what behind the ground data is, the, the facts of what's going on down there. And then, and that with some, you know, person perspective of what people's feelings are. But the decisions should be driven by the data, not what people's own beliefs and thoughts are. So, Mr. Cooper, do you have something? No, I, I agree with that. I think that if you open it up to the public too early, it's going to, <clears throat> there's going to be too many misconceptions out there. So, um, I agree getting the, getting the data first and getting some sort of plan objective to present to the public is a much easier way to do it. Oh. I just wanted to offer a, a suggestion. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. Um, something that we've done uh, quite successfully to bridge this gap is to have uh, surveys done that we then get to treat like data. Um, in particular, 
if we if you're able to drive a, a simple online survey but have folks be driven to it very actively through whatever outreach mechanisms you possibly can when in the process is your decision we often do it very early ourselves we're able to get folks if you get you know a few hundred or even more responses um, sometimes it's through intercept surveys uh, it can be done in a number of ways but you leave the survey open for months so that when you get to the end when you're actually presenting the other data you've collected you've had lots of time to have everybody's individual IP address survey come in. Um, perceptions on what they would like. You know, how many people would prefer wider sidewalks? How many people feel threatened crossing the main street? Do you come here often? Do you wish it was easier to get to the other side of the street? What would you like to see better on this block? A lot of that, when you turn into pie charts and bar charts, becomes really good data not only to help des drive a design, but oftentimes to help guide the public through a process that can be way too open-ended when they're just offering opinions. <clears throat> if you show that you've actually taken opinions from them and hundreds of others like them, it's easier to refute a misperception when you get to the point of a public meeting. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, looking at the proposals, <coughs> there seems to be focused work for everything up until the draft report. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that this committee wants to take on the responsibility of doing that, that commentary. But uh, creation of a public participation after completion of the draft report might be more and they've got some they've got everything mm -hmm. to look at rather than nothing. Or just not nothing, but you know what I mean? Sure. How do you feel about that? I uh, I think my hesitation would be that if we were developing alternatives, uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to have the public feel like they don't have a role in commenting on any alternative. That, that is developed. In other words, uh, you don't want too much of the report done so they feel like their comment is not is going to be ignored. Basically. So I think the existing conditions and having that information done and, and then maybe taking an opportunity to explain it to the public and then asking some uh, how would you fix this type questions, even though that's been done to a certain sense during the correct process. Uh, might make sense, and uh, and then having the ability to, to have uh, rec the uh, comments weigh into the selection of an alternative that people feel more comfortable with uh, certainly would make sense as well. So you're you're talking about having a public process uh, around slightly before or slightly after uh, or step eight. Yes. Yes, and then perhaps another one uh, around, you know, between eight and nine. So something after seven and something after eight. Yes. Uh, any thoughts on this? Seems to make sense. I um, I don't know if this is in disagreement with uh, some of the earlier comments, but I agree with uh, Jason. Uh, I think that uh, there's a way to have a public, some public involvement early. It might actually, I think it might help you with the data collection. I mean, you might, mm -hmm. you might start to look at something that's different from what you were expecting to look at before, and you also will get the some of those qualitative elements that uh, could really help with some of this. Could help shape the process. Sure. I, I, I have no objection to putting in a uh, online survey. That's something that we've, we've done frequently, and, and we can develop that. we would just be looking for the city for assistance to make sure that that link is shared and, and we're getting you know as many opportunities as we can for comments as, as yeah, possible. If we're going to do that, then I do think we should have a... Um, my suggestion would be to have a, have a department uh, and... Uh, yeah, let the department spearhead this. Uh, 
-hmm. Not this commission, I don't think, because we don't meet that frequently. Sure. And uh, I think we want to have, I, I think an ad hoc committee is probably a little overkill. I'm, I'm okay with that. I just wanted to run it by and, and see if I was getting that correct or not. So, I, you know, is there a department here? Well, I know Central Services is in here, so we can nominate them. <laughs> is there a department here that wants to work with the PVPC in, in getting this? Well, it's probably going to be PPW and planning together. Mm -hmm. Should there be new persons on board? Okay. So, we'll add in uh, developing a draft survey, uh, basically early on in, in this outline and uh, we'll run it by uh, DPW and planning and um, we'll get that up and start collecting uh, that uh, information. And so then the other uh, is around six. I don't, I, I'm also going to speak. This is, you know, by the time you're finishing this up, I won't be on this commission, so you know, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> 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 All right, I have, yeah, we could be nominated. Uh, I think public involvement before step eight is sufficient. I, I don't think we'll need much after. Okay. Um, but that's my, that's my, I think. As you're developing some of the, some of your uh, recommendations, or as you're working on this sort of conceptual stage, that that's when you want the public to, to give, its, give its thoughts. But uh, I think afterwards, um, you're going to get a lot of I likes, I don't likes, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and then um, and people who missed the boat on the pre-step eight are trying to go back before that. So I think I think it's uh, I think after you do eight, nine, and ten, that's fine. But I think we do want something right in that in that eight stage. In that maybe it's right during it. You know, when you're analyzing sure. you want the public there to see some of the thoughts and to, to add their own. But then they would have to develop alternatives to get to that set, as opposed to having public input before they look at the alternatives analysis that comes from that yeah. meeting. No, I think you're right. I mean, I, I don't and then think afterwards, yeah. you can say, okay, some people thought of this, but that's not going to work, and this is why. So I think step eight needs to be. It's like a two-step thing. Yeah, and step eight is almost two things. <laughs> Preliminary analysis and right. something like that. And then the people that show up that never do about anything. Right. <laughs> well, that's, if that's what you want. I think mean, we want it right before that. And I also think that um, uh, this will be next year, but I think the commission could offer a host an event like that uh, if we don't want to do it. Yeah, I'd actually like to see the draft survey just you know, go over that. It doesn't have to go through the commission. But well, you might as well. You might as well. You might as well. Yeah. If, if you have. So, um, the commission will, uh, in, is, it, is it a month from now too early? For the survey? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we can have that uh, set up. Kelly's has to do it, so I can... <laughs> <laughs> you can make any promise. I, I think that's uh, reasonable, yeah. So, um, um, can we see it a month from now before it launches, or sure. something like that? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Which on the agenda for yeah. Ms. Parmar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a little confused. Is the survey going to be considered the public participation? I would consider it one element of public participation uh, just to get the ball rolling so we get a sense of what people's, the sum of the public's concerns are for our study. Okay. And then another piece. Was, it, was there another question of creation of a project advisory group? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, I was saying maybe not, but if you think it's a good idea, we can discuss it. It, Gary, is your project scheduled based on a, a budget or a time frame you have to use grant dollars or something? Well, we're um, we're under uh, uh, we anticipate this being a one year study. Okay. We uh, so I have the schedule going throughout the federal fiscal year, but my concern really is the ability to collect data at this time of year, mm -hmm. uh, especially pedestrian data because it's sometimes weather dependent. So, if we can collect more data over the next month, you know, into November, 
and we feel good about the quality of data we get. We might not need to be doing waiting until uh, March or April to, to collect some additional data. I'm pretty confident I can go out and I can get the automobile data. I know I can get the, the traffic data. The crash data, you know, is, is a request and it's going through. The bike head data that really concerns me because of the weather um, and because uh, you know most people are going to be apt to walk or ride their bike on, on a nicer day. So uh, that might mean we have to go back out in April and maybe confirm what we've done. <laughs> Especially for the PED data, it varies dramatically when you are taking multiple. I mean, the bikes are a lot more people go through. But. Right, and, and I think uh, time of year as well. You know, there's, you could say there's an advantage of going out during, you know, December because you have shoppers that are going to be out there walking around. And it's an opportunity to get PED data. Um, but uh, really, we know that you want to be getting the data in North Hampton with colleges. That's one of the keys as well. We have interns available to do a lot of work in the month of January. It just doesn't happen to work out from a time standpoint in this case because the students are away in break. So, um, An average day would be like the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to consider opportunities for, you know, we've got to look at maybe a, a potential pedestrian peak. And maybe we've missed that window. Um, you know, and it might be better to do it in the spring. So, no, um, I think that, but I think the peak might be in the Senate before that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Saturday, on Saturday is an inauguration. Oh, right. Uh, um, yesterday and today we didn't have classes for the fall recess. Um, classes end on, uh, Wednesday at noon before Thanksgiving, is that when that thing happened? Yes. The following week was the same as any other week. Actually, no classes Wednesday. No classes at all on Wednesday? I think that's right. closing. I don't know when classes end this year, but. Um, this first week in December. I think that the number of students on campus drops off very quickly, even though you have a, a four day study period, four days of finals, a lot of the students. Managed to jam all that stuff into the first four days. I don't know how they do it. And they okay. So you're saying don't plan on collecting data in really past the, the first week of December because they're already at the finals. Yep. Week and That's right. Right. Once classes end the first week of December, it's going to be pedestrian traffic with uh, the routine will change dramatically. Okay. No, thank you. The weekend before Halloween would be very good. Saturday yeah. before Halloween. I bet you that's good enough, that. Yeah. In my case, it's also a question of staff to go right. so, so, can we? The zombie walk. But they walk slow, though. <laughs> can we get uh, back to, do we need a project advisory committee? This commission could appoint one, the mayor could appoint one. Do we need one that's separate from this commission or the board or, or the departments? I mean, I think we'll work with them this month. Then can, Catch up today each month. Anyone, does anyone want to defend that idea? Okay, that's good. Um, then the last piece is uh, I guess we have some time to figure out the other element of public participation around eight and nine. Yes. Okay, so we can work on that as, the, as it comes forward. Sorry, uh, Gary, last uh, day of classes at Smith College is Tuesday, December 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else you need from us? No, this has been very helpful, and I want to thank you for the opportunity. To, you know, again, we, we haven't even started work on this, so it's a good opportunity to get feedback and hit the ground running. So, I mean, that's so where we're at. Office of Planning and Development can connect you with, uh, with the mayor's office a little bit, and you can find out some of the, some of the other busy days that mm -hmm. Hampton experiences. Uh, for instance, I was joking when I said that the Saturday before Thanksgiving is, is bag day, where everyone yeah, receives yeah. 20% off, right. and Saturday before Halloween, obviously, is the, is the zombie pub crawl, and so on. So all of these <laughs> events, if you want to at least know about the time of this Saturday. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Still zero zero in the Red Sox game.
Um, <laughs> BBW updates. Uh, Kennedy Road reconstruction started this morning. It's going to last for about three weeks total. Um, crack ceiling will start next Monday in the city. That will take about a week to get through that contract. North Elm Street sidewalk has been completed and work began today on the Sheldon Field sidewalk, which links the parking right to the basketball course down there. Any questions for today? Any update on uh, replacement for work? We oh, have missed that. Oh, missed that. Yeah, we, we completed the interview and we made an offer to a gentleman and we to hear his response. So. Updates from the meetings. I have an idea about the parking lot. Somebody I can get more about the stuff that we have to receive.